I'd like to, to now introduce Maria Ressa, one of the world's most well-regarded journalists who has been prosecuted, jailed, continues to be intimidated uh, for getting on the wrong side of the president of the Philippines. And uh, we'll be speaking uh, some more to her, but she'll be our keynote speaker. So if you could please uh, welcome uh, Maria to the stage. I seem taller than I really am here, aren't I? <laughs> it's a great vantage point. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, it is so nice to see so many friends here as well and to see mommy. <laughs> and, um, so the title of what I'm going to, the speech I, I wrote for you is actually creating the future together. Creating the future together, except that it is about dealing with the destruction that we're living through now, right? Seeing Tamara Pearl reminded me I was in touch with Omar Sheikh and tried to get CNN at that point to send me to Karachi. They refused. And I, while I railed against that at that time, you know, it's a far more dangerous world. And those were the times when it was turning. So thank you first for inviting me tonight. I mean, this is such a special night, the launch of the investigative journal. It is also an existential moment not just for journalism, we know this, we talk about this, but it is also an existential moment for all democracies around the world. We're living in truly unprecedented times where dealing with the dis creative destruction that we're dealing with, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Where crisis is opportunity and fear can either save your life or doom your future. So. Make no mistake about this. Journalism really is in crisis. We are under attack, not just as sustainable news organizations, but as individual journalists, where online violence easily turns into real world violence. The exponential attacks and lies on social media are familiar to you here, as they're familiar in the United States and many other democracies around the world. After all, President Duterte was elected just a month before Brexit. And like in other parts of the world, disinformation networks. I'm not going to call it misinformation. It is disinformation networks. They pound the fracture lines of society, spreading hate and violence, fomenting, they're forming these violent ghettos that divide our societies and ultimately they weaken our democracies. The Philippines is your cautionary tale. It is both a curse and a privilege to be a senior journalist in my country today. On the one hand, the baton has been passed to us, to my generation, uh, Liz's generation. It, so the baton was passed to us at this, I know it's a historic moment. We're gonna look back 10 years from now, we're gonna look at this and say, this is a critical moment in history. Everything is changing and every decision we make can change what our future is going to look like. But on the other hand, staying silent, you heard Tamara say it, silence is actually complicity. And not speaking is consent to unspeakable violence and to impunity. Not just in the Philippines' brutal drug war, which the UN estimates have killed more than 27,000 people since July 2016. That's a huge number. but. Aside from that impunity, you're also talking about the insidious mass manipulation of information, of information operations in our society. A lie told a million times, pounded a million times, becomes fact. And if you're a traditional news group and you don't respond, which is what we were all told to do, you've just helped the lie become a fact. This is why our world is upside down, because without facts, we don't have truth. Without truth, we have no trust. Journalists are the gatekeepers of facts, right? And while the social media platforms have taken over and they've become the world's largest distributor of news, they didn't take the gatekeeping powers. So here we are in our generation trying to fight for the facts. That is the battle of our generation. This. Well, with, without truth, there's no trust. The voice with the loudest megaphone with the most power wins. 
The pattern of exponential attacks and lies on social media is clear in my country, in the Philippines. And this is, I'll describe it for you, and I think you'll find it's familiar. It's bottom-up astroturfing. Fake grass, right? It's just the lie keeps going, and there's a bandwagon effect. And people think that there are a lot more people that, that believe that. Then on the side, there's co-opted media or state proxies that hit laterally. And then finally, the last part is top-down. Um, so it's bottom-up, lateral, and top-down. Uh, in my case, it took about a year with these exponential attacks. And then a year, about a year later, President Duterte said the exact same thing, the exact same lie, which is that Rappler is 100% American owned. Um, and he didn't say it in a press conference. He said it in his State of the Nation address. So here I was covering it, and I just you know, tweeted immediately, Mr. President, you're wrong. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. These were the attacks against Rappler, the startup that we created against me, against journalists, against anyone who's perceived to question. Why is questioning criminal? Um, our investigative journalists in Rappler have documented it all. This is what we need to do. We document. We shine the light. It is our best defense, and it is our only, our only defense. The, but when you shine the light, there are consequences, right? So from January 2018, the Philippine government filed at least 11 cases and investigations against me and Rappler. In a little more than three months, I had to post bail eight times. In a five-week period around Valentine's Day, I was arrested twice. I was detained. My Valentine's gift from my government was allowing me to post bail. I've always wanted to experience as much of life as I can. We all do. That's why we also became journalists, right? But you know the going to jail part? That part uh, I could do without. Um, because my only crime is to do what I have always done in more than three decades. That is to be a journalist, to speak truth to power. So what can we do? Well, it's clear that our, our industry and one nation alone can't solve this problem because local is global. The problems in the Philippines were spurred by social media platforms, decisions that were made outside of our country. Local is global, and global is local. The online attacks against me were enabled. Technology was the accelerator, and we've seen this in many other parts of the world. Don't get me wrong. Uh, these are the same American social media platforms that also allowed us to create Rappler in 2012. At that time, we grew 100%, to 300% year on year in terms of reach and revenue. We couldn't have challenged traditional news groups without this. So I know what's good about it, right? And I, I don't want to get rid of it, which is why we continue working with them. But in 2016, something went drastically wrong. That was when the world changed, when we again clearly saw that whoever controls the information gains power. Information is power. The irony, of course, is that most of the countries most affected by these algorithms, by what you created in the West, um, countries in the global south, like the Philippines, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, our countries are the ones most affected because our institutions are extremely weak. And yet, we don't have a seat at the table. So here's the upside. Today, that is changing. I'm here, right? That's pretty good. That's, um, so global is local, and local is global, where investigative journalism and cross-border collaboration is needed more today than ever. And not one news group alone can do it. We need to collaborate in the same way these disinformation networks are collaborating and building a web it's like a terrorist network running throughout that is pounding, that is making lies, facts, right? This is part of the reason we decided at Rappler to partner with the investigative journal. We wanted to learn about other parts of the world. We need to do cross-border collaboration because that's the way crime moves, right? I first met Fami last April at the Clooney Foundation's launch of Trial Watch. We were on stage. He was on my right. Um, and I listened to him. Uh, 
Trial Watch was a global effort to let captured systems of justice know that the world is watching. Journalists need something like this, right? During that panel, while I was listening to Fami, 438 days in prison, right? So I'm just listening to him on my right. On my left was Jason Rezaian. He spent 544 days in an Iranian prison. And then <laughs> listening to what they went through, I realized I didn't have it so bad after all. You know, not so bad. Um, we can still win this. They got out. But it took a huge toll. And then I asked Fami after the panel ended, I said, you know, how how did you get through it? What, what do you think I should do? You know what he said? Get Amal to represent you. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Get Amal as your lawyer. And then we kind of talked about this. And then, you know, I took his advice seriously. And yesterday, we announced our international legal team, led by Amal Kuli. <laughs> and Keelan Gallagher, who is leading the legal defense team that is fighting for justice, justice for Daphne Caruana Galizia in Malta. Right? Impunity should not happen. And the only way journalists can continue to do their work is if we can stop that. So the lead counsel in Justice for Daphne movement is also with us. And oh man, listening to them, I'm, I'm in awe. They're joined by Chanya Gingsu, so I'm going to learn something about Turkey firsthand. Catherine O'Brien, who comes from Melbourne. So they, here's this global team. And then they are working with Covington and Berlin councils. Ambassador Dan Feldman, he is somebody I used to chase when he was at the State Department. Um, First Amendment lawyer Kurt Wimmer, and, and here's how it goes, a classmate from my graduating class. Uh, he's with Covington, and part of the reason the team is working, Peter Lichtenbaum. I call this team the Justice League. And I really do think they wear capes, you know? And I think that as we sort out, as the journalists are trying to, feel, to, to figure out how we are going to deal with this creative destruction that we're living through, the legal profession also has to do that, right? And I'm surrounded now by these sharp legal minds, and I think that they're creating a new world um, that is going to help journalists. Our, these lawyers are standing up for the rights of, and you'll hear this from Amal Clooney uh, tomorrow when, they, when we open the global media freedom, when she opens it. Um, so it gives me great hope. It gives me great hope, not just for me, but also that what they find, what they create in a legal system um, will help journalists trying to do our jobs. Shine the light. Shine the light. Um, when I woke up this morning, Amal Clooney was trending in the Philippines. It's 4.30 in the morning in, in, in London and trending Amal Clooney. You know, I feel like I have a little flashlight. Um, Amal Clooney has a lighthouse. So, you know, it is a brave new world. We have to embrace it. It is painful. It is destroying an old world order. And, I, you know, I, when I look for solutions, I always look back to post-Holocaust. What did the global community do? Nation states came together. Econ the economic system, Bretton Woods, NATO, militaries, and you had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right? The internet has changed the world as fundamentally as, as World War II did, and I think this is where we're, we need to go. So, as we move forward, investigative journalism is needed. More than ever, it becomes harder to do our jobs, but it's a brave new world. We need to embrace it. We investigate, we expose, and then we build. We're going to have to create the future together, and I'm looking forward to working together to do that. Thank you.